International Journal of Health Policy and Management Quality and speed are our culture and the keys to our success. Welcome to the audio summary section of the International Journal of Health Policy and Management. Hello, my name is Trish Greenhalgh. I'm a medical doctor and a professor at the University of Oxford in the UK. I study innovation and in particular the work of multi-stakeholder research collaborations such as academic health sciences centres and biomedical research centres. I wrote a paper called The Bright Elusive Butterfly of Value in Health Technology Development and that paper looked at the multiple challenges involved in getting a new drug, a medical device or other technology from early stage development right through to regulatory approval and successful use in patients. Too often, we assume that there's a linear pipeline from developing a new product to generating benefits. And we talk about things like translational pull, as if all we need to do is pull a bit harder and the innovations will move along the pipeline a bit faster. In fact, these linear metaphors are useful up to a point, but they're also dangerous because they fool us into thinking that the journey will tend to be both straight and smooth. In reality, the system isn't a pipeline at all. It's complex, it's messy, and it's full of misalignments. In our paper, we use the metaphor of an elusive butterfly to problematize the notion of value. Value for shareholders might not mean value for patients. Indeed, as Pascal Lahoux and her colleagues have shown in their series of case studies, one of the main misalignments in the system is that surprisingly often we fail to consider whether a new health technology is actually desirable from the perspective of the patient before we go through the process of developing and approving it. I spoke to Dr. Rajnashi Banerjee, a consultant physician who also helps run a successful medical device company called Perspectum Diagnostics. And I asked him what he felt was needed to generate value in a medical innovation. The, the main thing is firstly to have um, a good technology with a good clinical application and to construct uh, a utility case which from the commercial angle is a business case but from the healthcare angle is why should we care about this technology? Answering that question is fundamental. When Dr. Banerjee was a young doctor, he had to do the traumatic procedure of liver biopsy on patients. He thought that with the sophisticated imaging techniques that were coming onto the horizon, he could save many of his liver patients the pain and risk of a needle biopsy by developing what he called the non-invasive liver biopsy. So um, the base technology is you use an MRI scanner, a magnetic resonance, image, resonance imaging scanner, to uh, characterise uh, liver tissue, just as you use it to characterise brain tissue, prostate, heart and, and other organs. So to have a way of diagnosing it and stratifying it quickly and accurately and robustly seems as it should have utility for the healthcare service and should be com- profitable as a commercial enterprise. Um, So the steps to achieve this really were to form the company, secure the IP, uh, repeat the initial clinical trials to show that they weren't one-offs and the results have been very, very good, Uh, and then really to scale up uh, and talk to the regulators about getting CE marking and FDA marking uh, and then providing the service to hospitals so that they could use it for their patients. But going from this initial idea to something that was ready and approved to be used on patients was not easy. Here he is describing the challenges, beginning with a comment about Oxford being a hotbed of biomedical innovation where there is strong support for building relationships beyond the university. Now the new chief executive of the Trust, Bruno Holtzhoff, he is very supportive of creating uh, a hotbed of innovation which necessarily includes industry collaborations or nascent industries springing out of Oxford. And the real reason for this at base is if you develop a 
technology for healthcare utilisation, it has to be standardised and it has to get regulatory approval. And you cannot do that from the university sector alone. So you have to develop a company ethos with the relevant standards that allow you to do that. Um, and that's really translating from laboratory bench to clinical bedside. Dr Banerjee's story shows that if you've got a good idea with a clear relative advantage, and what liver patient wouldn't want their biopsy to be non-invasive, you can generate high value for the patient and also make health services run more smoothly and make some money as well. But it's not always plain sailing. One problem is that the value of a new technology may not be apparent at the early stages of development. I spoke to Professor Gary Ford, a stroke physician from Oxford, who's also the director of Oxford's Academic Health Sciences Network. In this clip, he describes the discovery of tissue plasminogen activator, or TPA, a drug that turned out to be revolutionary for stroke patients. But in the initial stages of development, it looked like TPA would only help a tiny fraction of the patients, so its value proposition seemed dubious. So one of the difficulties with any new idea, new product, is that at the early stages, it's very hard to know the what the final value will be. Some ideas prove, as we know in research, to um, be wrong or the approach doesn't work or needs a lot of adaptation and most innovations undergo a process of change and adaptation. So um, it, health systems want to know before they invest their resources and effort what the value is, but there's a big unknown. Um, even with licensed drugs that come through a, a quite a highly regulated pathway, um, the, the ultimate value is often very hard to tell at the beginning and for devices and diagnostics it, it is uh, much less clear. I think one example uh, from uh, the, the um, area I practice in stroke medicine was the development of uh, tissue plasminogen activator to um, open up uh, arteries in patients with ischemic stroke which um, in the beginning people thought this would be a therapy that was only applicable to a very small uh, number of patients. Uh, when we first implemented the um, uh, therapy into the service I led, uh, people were talking about only 1% of stroke patients being eligible for TPA. And that was because they were looking at the very narrow criteria that had been used in the early trials. What we found with um, additional trial evidence and actually more from registries and, and big observational series was that the therapy was beneficial in a much wider group of patients. For example, uh, the initial trials uh, did not include people over the age of 80 years and we didn't treat very elderly people. Um, and now we see the utilisation of uh, TPA in well-organised stroke services is around 15%, or even up to 20%. But the real value of TPA was that it uh, was a disruptive innovation which completely changed the approach to stroke. Before we had TPA, Typically, a uh, stroke specialist would go around a stroke unit um, often just twice a week. But we then had to change a service into a 24-7 service where specialists were available to assess patients and make treatment decisions. And what that did was it meant all the other aspects of stroke care were undertaken uh, more, uh, more rapidly. Uh, we had much earlier access of patients to stroke units, they got early assessment, multidisciplinary care, and we've seen a progressive reduction in standardised mortality rates for stroke patients. And then, if we then look at the organisation of services, it led to the creation of larger, higher volume, more productive, higher quality services, as evidenced, for example, by the London Stroke Reconfiguration. These aspects of the value of innovation are very hard to recognise at the beginning and only come over time. As Professor Ford's story of TPA illustrates, sometimes the trajectory of a medical innovation is non-linear, leading to unanticipated benefits and indeed potentially to unanticipated harms as the innovation undergoes late health technology assessment and studies in new target populations. Not all of these benefits, nor all of the harms, can be predicted at the outset. So assessing the value propositions of new technologies is an inexact science. In our paper, we suggest that whilst the current system is imperfect, there are already some impressive intersectoral synergies with publicly funded R&D sometimes leading to successful spin-outs and rapid benefits to patients. 
We suggest that as multi-stakeholder cross-sectoral research in medical innovation becomes more common, universities and the lay public should be more proactive partners in driving the process to ensure that innovations are both desirable and publicly affordable. We give some examples of models of good practice from other countries and we invite others to join in the debate. Thank you.